Good afternoon. Um, welcome to Canberra Museum and Gallery. My name is Virginia Rigney. I'm the Senior Curator in Visual Art here at CMAG. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to the Ngunnawal Ngambri people on the land. On, this is their land on which we, we meet today. And to respect and honour their continuing connection with this country and the way in which they support um, many Indigenous creative people support our work here at CMAG and help to shape our understanding of programming and our engagement with objects. Um, this is a kind of dual show you've got today um, and I'd like to welcome and introduce David Hobbs. David is a architect and heritage consultant. He's, he works for Philip Leeson Architects and he's been um, uh, commissioned by the, the CFC, our parent organisation, to consult with us um, as the Civic Centre, um, sorry, Civic Precinct goes through a process of its um, heritage work. I've just put this slide up first because I think that really speaks to it. It's, it's a new uh, photograph in our collection. And when we bought three and a half thousand photographs from the Fairfax archive at, towards the end of last year, we were not only buying the front of the images, but we were also buying the back. And the backs tell you so much. And I guess. The reason for, for putting this one up there is that caption at the top um, and this real confidence um, that that caption revealed about planning and that how you know, this, this Canberra is proof that, um, oh, you, you all can read it better than me, but um, that uh, a new city can provide a superior environment um, and quality of life. And you can see how many times that image was then used. So I think it was first used in 1968. So the, the lead architects for this project, or the lead architect, Roy Simpson, the firm Youngkin Freeman in Melbourne, and um, David's going to talk to us a little bit about that. The firm was set up by a group of young guns in Melbourne in about 1933. They had all um, another firm where they were sort of just starting life as, as journeymen, really, and decided that they wanted to do their own thing. So the original partners who were what Rob Youngkin, uh, Tom and John Freeman, and um, uh, what's the other guy's name? Balcom Griffiths, set up the firm Youngkin Freeman. Um, Roy Simpson joined them in 1938. Um, and initially they were doing sort of rather traditional houses for the wealthy in Melbourne's inner suburbs, a little bit of hospital work. Um, and then of course all of that was interrupted by World War II. Roy Simpson in particular went off and worked um, in a capacity for the military um, and got a lot of experience in sort of emerging technologies and prefabrication and uh, which stood him in good stead for the firm's subsequent work into the 50s. So when they, after the war had ended, um, the, the various partners had scattered during the war doing different things but they managed to pull themselves back together and reinvigorate the firm. Um, their firm flourished during the 50s and 60s and 70s, Melbourne-based. Um, they were very, they were thought of as very innovative and forward-thinking people. They were involved in some of the earliest glass curtain wall buildings in Melbourne. This, it's actually the building on the right of these two, um, which is the Norwich Union Insurance Building. And many of you will know the Meyer Music Bowl in Melbourne, which this firm designed as well, which for the time was very cutting edge tensile structure. So they had a reputation for being young and innovative, which was very attractive to the, the recently formed NCDC. So we're talking about 1958, 59 here. And they were looking for architects of high caliber to come and build beautiful buildings and structures for Canberra. Um, just talking a little bit about some of the influences of Roy Simpson and influences on a lot of architects of the time. And there were all sorts of movements circulating around the world post-World War II. In fact, some of these movements had their antecedents even before World War II. And if I talk about movements such as um, the Garden City, the Garden Suburb Movement, um, the Bauhaus in Germany, these are all ways of looking at design and working out new ways to create and design and build. The Bauhaus was very much about looking at um, a conjunction of architecture, design, art, sculpture, 
into a cohesive whole. The English New Towns, which was about post-war reconstruction, and this is an example of Stevenage in just north of London, which is one of the earliest New Towns. And you can see there, I mean, if you squint, it really could be Civic Square. Sometimes I think architects didn't, re they don't always reinvent the wheel, you know. And I think particularly in Australia, a lot of our architects got a lot of influence from journals that circulated the world. They could see what was going on in Europe and the United States, and they were keen to bring those ideas here. So this is Stevenage. It's an interesting combination of two photographs. So we can see on the left in the 50s when it was fairly new, um, with the reflection pond, with the tower, and with these rather uh, stripped, simple buildings. And then that Stevenage in more recent times, um, still working well as a public square. But interestingly, you can see how the pool has been added to. There are a couple of extra tiers in that pool. And there's an interesting parallel with the way that the reflection pool here was changed some years ago. Um, the other influences, if we're talking about utopias, a big one is Brasilia, which was constructed at a vaguely similar time to, to the main construction period of Canberra in the 50s and 60s. Again, the idea of building this ideal city or town more or less in the middle of nowhere. So there are some parallels with Canberra here. And of course, um, the integration, this is again Brasilia, buildings designed by Oscar Niemeyer, very much the exploration of architecture and art and sculpture being brought together. It's the presidential palace on the left with those very strong sculptural forms, both as a, a standalone sculpture, but also incorporated as part of the structure itself. <clears throat> and then that's the, the main uh, National Congress building in Brasilia. Again, with those, those <coughs> pardon me, I'm battling a cold at the moment, but you know, there's very strong, the dominant vertical, the dominant horizontal, and then these very sort of fluid curved forms, one, up, one bowl, one's upside down and one's the, up, the right way up, so to speak. And you can almost see parallels in the, um, the fly tower and the white rendered sculptural forms on the Canberra Theatre here. So all of these things were influences on our architects here. I'll just say a little bit about stripped classical. <coughs> stripped classical architectural style was, came into its own um, in the post-war period. Um, it sort of incorporates modern elements of classical architecture with modernist design. So as it is, as the name says, it's stripped down, but it's very simple rhythms of bays, colonnades, uh, and counterpoint of horizontal and vertical elements. So at the top is our National Library, 1968. On the right is the Law Courts, over here, also designed by Roy Simpson. <coughs> Now here in the bottom left corner is the Lincoln Center in New York. Now this was one of the first purpose designed theater buildings which are with a range of amenities. And in fact, the Canberra Theater, our own center here, was very much in that same mold. If you remember, the theater here was completed in 1965. It actually um, came before the Sydney Opera House and before Festival Hall in Melbourne. So it was actually a very cutting, cutting edge building for its time and it was happening at the same time or in the sort of oeuvre of the Lincoln Centre and slightly earlier the Royal Festival Hall in London. So what was the context for um, this moment of Civic Square's commissioning? Canberra had actually been in the doldrums for almost a generation with uh, after the, the enthusiasm of the opening of Parliament and the initial construction of the Sydney and Melbourne buildings and the, the sort of struggling um, uh, transferal of some public servants to Canberra, the combination of, of the Depression, the World War, um, and a really also a sort of lack of, I guess, a, a sense of what this national capital would be, really slowed um, the potential for the city to grow or the city to kind of have confidence. So it was it was two critical things. It was um, Bob Menzies as Prime Minister who really promoted the idea that Canberra should proceed um, forthwith and also the, the commissioning of uh, Halford, Lord Halford from Halford from the UK who came and gave his recommendations in response to the Griffin Plan. And so this particular image is, was published in Architecture in Australia, 
Um, it was a special Canberra issue in December 1959. And this reflects um, then the NCDC's response after about 12 months, I think, to Halford's um, recommendations. So if you want to comment on that, mm. David. OK, so just going through some of the elements again. We've got the, the Burley Griffin axis here from City Hill to Mount Ainsley, with the, the Ainsley Avenue being shown as a, a broad landscape boulevard. Um, City Hill here, the Sydney and Melbourne buildings on this side here, and what's become Civic Square here. Now, originally, there were plans for two large, quite tall buildings, donut-shaped again, but very much presenting to London Circuit, and then the wings extending rearwards and, and the podium up to the hill. Um, that is not eventually was not what to be. was built, no. So on the, on the opposite side of the page, on, on the same page, is this scheme, um, which was the, uh, the commissioned scheme. Uh, and you can, you can see it's a, it's a really beautifully rendered um, visualisation, and I think that this speaks to the, uh, the quality of the firm in being able to create such a render. Um, unfortunately, it's not in colour. I, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming potentially that the original will be in the archive in uh, Melbourne University archives where this firm's um, archives are kept. But you can really sort of see the form um, that we know today expressed in this, uh, in this drawing. Um, yes, there are certainly a few differences, but the indication of the, the gold columns, the significant sculpture, the water feature, um, and the, the view to the axis. I think it's worth pointing out that when one of, one of the initial comments of Lord Holford was that if Australia was serious about getting Canberra off the ground in the 50s, that it needed to provide a, a community for the people who lived here and, and start getting a move on with building cultural assets. Because hitherto there'd been a lot of work with government buildings, places where the people were going to work, but not where the people were going to play and interact culturally. And this, of course, had always been part of Griffith's, Griffin's vision. And I think it's worthwhile at this point to um, read the commentary from um, uh, J.B. Redmond in Architecture Australia in that December 59 issue. And he describes, the new offices form the two sides of a civic square which will be paved and graced by a pool, fountains and sculpture. A small city library will operate in one of the buildings until a permanent library can be built and in addition, there will be a small exhibition space. So already you have a sense that this is not a square just for administrative functions, but it's a place for people to have daily activities. <coughs> As time goes by, further associated developments will more, most definitely establish this area as the Civic Centre. The Commission has reserved a site for a modest auditorium within the Civic Group to stage concerts, theatre and ballet. As the town grows, it will be possible to build a city library for adults and children. In fact, all the services of a modern town will be established in this group as needed and as funds permit. And I think what's this, this next section of this quote is very interesting in the sense of, um, I guess, the possibilities that this design approach had. So it says, this long-term project, while an obvious need, will be somewhat unique in Australia. It will be one of our first efforts, that's the NCDC, at civic design, and by precept, it will provide stimulus to other growing and powerful cities to do likewise. The utmost flexibility is needed in the design of Civic Square because we now design for, say, 100,000 people. Several subsequent additions will be needed over several generations as the population doubles and redoubles. And then this is very telling. Changing preferences in architectural expression will add stimulating problems. So quite kind of perceptive. So here we see the buildings um, starting to come out of the ground. And I think from the photographs, you really do have that sense that this was really just building onto not much that was there. Creating something out of nothing. Yeah. Do you want me to talk to that yeah, yeah, for a second? Yeah. Okay. okay, so we can see here City Hill. Vernon Circle only just taking shape, but you can see how originally how open it was down that Ainsley Avenue axis. Um, the other halves of the buildings haven't gone in yet. Canberra Theatre isn't here, but you very much got the square, and also the fact that it was intended that visually 
it sort of continued, it sort of was contiguous with Ainley, Ainsley Avenue, even down to the, the fact that the, the paving pattern is continuing there across the road. And then the, and um, I guess what's, what's delightful here is that the fountain is, is working, um, you know, pretty much straight away. Yeah. Um, uh, and again, you can, you can see the way that the, um, yeah, the paving continues. And also you can see there's some paving up, well, I'll just orientate you. So we've got Ainsley Avenue coming along up here across to Civic Square, this beautiful reflection pond and fountain. Um, the checkerboard pattern, the very simple checkerboard pattern of paving, which was interspersed with originally just a few spare planter boxes, the podium, and then the same paving pattern above. And of course, subsequently, the Canberra Theatre basically straddled that and reinforced the axis up to City Hill there. And so this is how the grid then extends through the city um, within the space of a couple of years, this, um, that the grid continues into around the Monero Mall and around Garima Place. Um, and uh, so it kind of provides a kind of harmonious bleed between this civic precinct and the mall and the commercial precinct. Um, this, these photographs as well speak to, I guess, the appreciation of how to introduce soft landscaping into these into this paver and uh, yes david if you want to well yeah on. i mean as in the slides before you could see that the architect's vision was re really relatively spare and aiming not to be cutesy um, but obviously as time goes on people have varying ideas about what you have to do to um, humanize a space and as often happens today, they never can quite decide what's the right solution. You can see there every planter box is slightly different. <laughs> and, you know, some of those planter boxes could have been designed by Derek Wrigley, um, mm. manufactured it in Canberra, I think, with this cast concrete, the Pebble Creek con concrete. I'm being sure there'll be people here, in, perhaps in the audience, who, who um, can recognise some of those designs. Um, we had the Derek Wrigley show uh, here earlier this year and... Uh, Derek certainly did design some of these for the NCDC through the ANU design unit. But I guess what, um, what is also really significant about the whole, this whole project is the way that art is integrated with design and how, in, and how really integral that was to, the, to Roy Simpson's vision. And so the first artist that I want to reflect upon is uh, Frank Hinder. Frank, Hinder's, uh, Frank Hinder had a, a very close association with Canberra, first coming here as a war artist, 1942 to 43, 4. Uh, he was here working um, in, his, in a capacity as a camouflage designer and researcher. So I've just got a suite of images up here. The earliest is this Canberra image of the Canberra cyclists. This is a colour version of a black and white one that we have in our own collection. Um, but these other images are pretty contemporaneous with the work that he did for Civic Square. Um, in particular, I want the, the image in the centre was was produced um, just, I think, the year or, or two before. Um, and so what these images reveal is a sense of trying to bring, uh, I guess, flickering dynamism, uh, a sense of movement to um, the experience of being and seeing the painting. And this is reflected in Hinder's other later works, in his long-term fascination with kinetic art and, and light and sculpture. Um, the, the, the bronze inlaid that will be familiar to many in the, the floor of the ANU, um, uh, ANU, uh, ANU house, 1953, um, has, has also this sort of implied movement. But what I think is really fabulous about the Civic Square is, of course, the, the gold mosaic tiles. And when you really think about these tiles as an artwork, but as, a, as an artwork that really thoughtfully integrates design. You can, I I'm, I'm, can't wait to, to, to try and find the correspondences between Simpson and Hinder about this. But one can imagine their conversations together about um, you know, constructing a sense of a, um, an animated colonnade that as people walked in shade, that they would, um, their eye might catch little glimmers and, and reflections both from water and from sunlight. Um, as they keep out of rain or, or sun um, in the colonnades areas. So I think these, these are certainly one of the most significant um, features of the Civic Square design, um, and we're, I think we're really lucky that, um, that they are still there. Now, we're not going to talk about this now, but we, I'm just flagging it up because 
I'm really intrigued to know who did these. We'll talk about that one later. I'm just wondering if anyone knows. So this, this photograph, I think, um, has, uh, expresses the kind of eye view from as the pedestrian would walk, with, walk up towards Civic Square and engage with um, the original um, uh, entry area. And David, if you wanted to you'll comment no, on that. You'll notice here that originally you did step up slightly to the square, so it had a, sense, a slight sense of elevation and importance uh, relative to London Circuit. Um, and obviously for, for accessibility reasons more than anything, the whole surface has sort of been lowered down so it's, it's level across the road. Oh, and then there's this other really extraordinary element within the design of the square is this rippling effect of these, these windows. And this really also is, I guess, probably one of the most unsung elements of the design um, of the square in the sense that it's quite subtle but that it really does reflect a sense of, of rhythm. I mean, these could have been any standard format of, of a window treatment, but they're purposefully um, done in this particular rhythm. And then when I also blew this photograph up, I, I saw this kind of seven days, um, which um, on, all these, um, on all these window treatments there. So I'm very intrigued about uh, what they mean. So this, this talk is really a bit of a work in progress about understanding some of the bits of Civic Square. I think and when you and I were researching this, Virginia, we got onto the concept or one of the, the ordering themes of water and fluidity. Mm. And I get aside from, and the two strongest ones, of course, are the, uh, the mosaics, the flickering mosaic this rhythm in the window pattern. And when you leave here, go and have a look at it because it's really quite striking and maybe something you hadn't even looked at before. Again, that sort of flickering, or it could almost be reminiscent of musical notes on a score. And going back to water, of course, we've got the large reflection pool. But also, if you look down around the perimeter of the building, in the edge against the, the, the window walls, is smooth river rocks. Again, reminiscent of water, river, flow. Mm. And the original pool had beautiful black jet We've got, we'll come rocks. to that. We've we got a that. picture of that mm. yeah, coming up. Inside the rhythm continues, and this is um, just a couple of beautiful angles from the, um, the south building over the other side of the square, and just that, that sense of this really beautiful um, curve form um, that, the, that the stair creates. There's a similar, but not quite as grand um, ellipse stairway form um, next door leading up to Craft ACT. But, um, but yes, the, look, this is a really stunning form. I love that the base of the stair looks like a lady's heel. It's mm. quite stunning. And that beautiful, smooth, rendered structure contrasting with the really, for its time, very finely finished concrete. And so I guess in, in accentuating these kinds of images and speaking about fluidity, I think it kind of contrasts people's expectation um, or sort of initial reading of this square as very fixed and rigid. But it's looking at these finer details that allow you to appreciate this language of movement that I think is implied. But of course, I guess the most prominent of the, um, of the artworks that were commissioned as an integral um, to the... Um, to the whole Civic Square concept was the commissioning of Ethos by Tom Bass. And there appears to be, um, in, in having been involved in some public art bits and pieces over the years, reading the correspondence um, related to this um, commissioning is extraordinary. And I here want to um, really pay um, my great thanks to Tom Bass's widow, Margot, for allowing us to have a look at all of these, these correspondences and for um, we're so appreciative because a number of these other bits from this correspondence are not in the NCDC archive or ACT archive, so it's fantastic to have them. So I've just put up there um, uh, a sculpture that is probably the most immediate parallel to the, to the ethos here. It was done by by Bass um, for the ICI building in Sydney. It's, a, it's also um, in the uh, form of a copper deposit um, and relief. So you can see the scale that he was capable of working on here, and this would have given Simpson, uh, I think, a lot of confidence in working with him. I think what, what was also interesting in the correspondence was the clarity of this, um, of this letter that was sort of outlining the process and the um, the timeframes and what was expected and the payments. So I think 
uh, a good example in probably some days when you know artists were not necessarily really involved um, properly in um, in architectural projects, and you know still continues today. Um, so interesting to see that correspondence. But it wasn't easy. This was a difficult idea, a difficult brief to Tom Bass, creating a, a sculpture that would be a symbol for a city that was yet to really make itself, certainly yet to know itself. And Bass grappled with this for more than a year, producing a number of schemes. And the evidence of this kind of back and forth about the nature of what this uh, entity this sculpture should be is reflected in these correspondences and in these meeting notes and um, just in a, in a few of Bass's drawings. Um, so uh, I think that um, his, he, he notes that the, the final idea came in a bit of a brainwave to him. Um, uh, but there was, there was, John Overall was very much involved, Lindsay, um, uh, sorry, Daryl Lindsay, um, who was, you know, then an eminent but really quite conservative artist. Um, they're, you know, picking holes in, in the design and concept. But I think what was also fundamental to their critique and but their understanding of what the commissioning people wanted was that it shouldn't be an expression of a kind of political ideal, but it, it, that it should be an expression of a community spirit. And so that's really where um, Tom Bass and, and the whole of the commissioning process lands. So this is the maquette that he produces. It's a really professional maquette. He had it beautifully photographed. This is only one of about 10 images of, from all sides that he photographs. It's, it's a really professional um, approach to the commission. And there he is in his studio in Minto. Um, and you can sort of see you know, how very close it is to the, um, to the maquette. The correspondence related to actually getting it here and getting installed, I mean, it all happened very, very quickly in a, in a truck up from Sydney in a day or so. Um, the, the engineers from Young and Freeman sort of send him a letter saying, you know, it'd be good to know how heavy it is and we'll order the crane. And, you know, it's, it's pretty kind of quick. Um, and they sort of say, look, it'd be good if you got there to, a couple of days early before the opening launch so that you've got time to install it. And, you know, <laughs> and I guess you can see that perhaps like the concrete base has got its issues um, and there was some leaky, you know, a few bits and pieces going on with it, but, um, but it certainly got there. And here was the, um, the notes for the ceremony. So it was done really properly, really formally. Um, the, I think it's the daughter of the... Um, the Governor General, um, Catherine Sidney, um, unveils ethos. And I guess that's also an interesting choice about who who do you get to unveil this sculpture? So they chose a young woman, um, certainly with political associate well, with, with um, associations, but still a young person. And I think that also indicates that this was very much about um, a city that would um, be for the young and that they would be the ones to make the city. And here they are on parade, the Latvian dancers, the, the Christian uh, Anglicans, the girl guides or whatever they are, um, and just this, this real sense of excitement that this was this community place, this new civic square. The Latvians, I think, you know, particularly interesting uh, in terms of that reflection that Canberra was a place of many nationalities um, and celebrating many nationalities in a, at a time when other cities perhaps were not doing quite so well in that. Another lo lovely bit of evidence um, in the Tom Bass archive of a very warm relationship between Tom Bass and Roy Simpson. Roy's thank you letter to Tom, um, just, and I'll, you can read it, I hope, um, there, but I think it reflects that um, they really had a close relationship right through the, the commissioning and then, you know, afterwards, this is when the, the, when the theatre um, has opened, and I think uh, you know it's it's actually not often when you when architects have that sort of sense of embrace and collaboration with artists in such a way. Do you have any thoughts on any of that, David? Or no? um, yeah. yes, it is because often when you're working in an architect with a commission, you know I think sometimes it's easy just to get your head down and be very preoccupied with your own little aspect of it. But this looks this reads as a true collaboration, and they obviously became very firm friends, whether they were before, certainly they were at the end of this. 
I wish I got letters of things like that. <laughs> and of course, Tom Bass went on to do the magnificent um, Bass reliefs at the National Library. So this, um, you know, which is of course a much, both of these got much loved uh, within Canberra. And the, e and the and I guess the legacy of ethos continues uh, within the CMAG collection. Um, these are two bronze castings that were done 2001 and then a, another one in 2008 and we've acquired both of these for the collection. Um, they'll go on display in March next year in a new exhibition um, which will draw together some of these stories. So um, I encourage you to come back and see them in the flesh. And Ethos remained a very potent work for Tom Bass throughout his life. Um, you know, he was, he was a very busy sculptor, he produced a number of major works, but Ethos actually was one that he came back to many times, and this was a poem that he wrote in 2005. And I think um, in, in addressing this theme of design utopias, that this certainly is a poem that reflects that, that sense of, of a utopian place but also the pragmatic use of the, uh, the image for just about anything on, with tourism. We're thrilled um, also these, this photograph of Max Dupain um, that was in the Tom Bass archive. Um, it's a, um, a, pr a proposed gift from um, Margot, uh, Tom Bass's widow. So we're really delighted um, to be able to acquire this for the collection. And I think um, what this also speaks to is this relationship of the sculpture to water and to light. And Max Dupain, of course, is a masterful photographer at being able to, um, ref to photograph all of those elements together. You can imagine he would have been up there telling the people over the other side, make sure the lights are on and do this and do that. I've got to get this and, you know, um, to, to really be in the right place at the right time to get that image was quite extraordinary. Um, it's just struck me there how open, I mean, we're looking from Ethos across to the CMAG building, the North Building, um, how open and, and sort of active that frontage is compared to today. The curtains, are, you know, it's mostly clear glazing. You can see, you know, activity and exciting things happening in there. Also, I might add that the buildings were some of the earliest buildings in Australia to be to have a modern flood lighting so that they were supposed to be read at night, read and appreciated by the public at night. Whether they were or not is another matter, but... So, now the water feature. Mm, the water feature. So this is the original water feature. And you can see it was just... The idea was that it was to be very, very simple and not really draw attention to itself as a structure. Very plain, uh, horizontal form with this beautiful fountain in the middle, um, which did all sorts of weird and wonderful things, um, with water sprays, um, jets. Um, and around the perimeter, you can just see the river rocks around the perimeter there. Um, is, is there another photo, of Virginia? They seem to be black and glossy. Maybe they're just wet. Well, there's, there's river rocks in the, in the pond as well, I think, aren't there? Yes, mm. yeah. But the idea was that the fountain was a lovely place. It, was, it gave you a sense of repose, the reinforcement of the theme of water, probably a place where the officially or unofficially kids played, um, played with the stones, dipped their hands in the water on a hot day. Um, and unfortunately, I think that... The, so the, the original was removed about 20 years ago. I think the idea was that it was felt that it took up too much space in the square from public, you know, gathering. So then um, the second phase of Civic Square development happens, um, and this is the, the theatre and the playhouse. Um, the, we mentioned earlier the, um, os the parallels with the Oscar Niemeyer, very plastic forms, um, that white um, uh, sculpted shape of the fly tower and the, and the rooftop. Um, is really, I, I guess, a related but, but um, you know, progressed aesthetic from this 1959 design. And you can see how the original design very much reinforced the access through to City Hill, um, the podium steps and the loggia linking the two performance halls. Now, there is a woman involved in this story. <laughs> Her name is Frances Burke. Um, and I'd like to um, acknowledge here um, 
the Francis Burke project, um, the team members here that are visiting from Melbourne, Rosman, Robin Oswald Jacobs and Dr. Danette Carter, thank you very much. Um, Frances Burke was really one of Australia's preeminent textile designer. Um, she had been working since the late 1930s, 40s, um, her, I guess her heyday in the 1950s. Um, this commission that came from Roy Simpson was really at the, um, towards the end of her life. Um, but you can see that, um, you know, she was a very purposeful um, woman who had um, a, an extraordinary flair. So I'm just going to kind of, um, and I don't always do this with talks, but to also bring myself into the picture here in the sense that uh, as, a, um, as someone who was born in Canberra the year before the lake was filled, and my, my father's business was across the road in the Bailey Arcade, my mother, um, we, our house was in Campbell, coming to Civic Square to go to the library, to go to the theatre was something that I would have done once or twice a week. And I guess I must, I, I guess I, I can evidence that I am evidence of the impact of design as a young child in coming into these spaces on a regular basis. And so for me, not just the, the, the gold um, mosaics as you entered the library, and I've still got my library bag from then because it was so special. But, and the, this black and white photograph doesn't do it justice, but it's these curtains that were in the, the main theatre, that were the things that, that I just will never forget how beautiful they were. And it was so, it was fabulous um, this week to be able to go and see the originals that are, um, well, a fragment of an original that uh, is held in the National Gallery of Australia. So this design, Black Opal, just um, really, it was quite innovative for Frances Burke herself. It's quite different from many of her other designs. It's it's quite free. It um, it's, it involves both these these dark colours, the, well, the black and the purple, but the heat of the orange and the yellow and the reds. Um, and it, to see it on mass along that huge expanse expanse of that um, of the proscenium arch there in the theatre was just um, extraordinary. So um, it's this the curtain was decommissioned uh, in the 1980s. Um, sadly, we haven't found. Um, original fragments of it. Um, so it's it's marvellous that there is this one uh, in the National Gallery. But there was this other really um, beautiful um, sculpture which is which is still, you know, as part of the precinct but now is sited on the other side of the entry area. Sadly, I think a little bit lost where it is. Um, it's, a, it's a really marvellous work. So then how does Civic proceed um, in the 1970s, it's a gathering place here. This is um, another image from our collection, uh, uh, an amateur photographer capturing um, a Canberra day. Um, I, th I just put this one in. This is the NCDC float going past. Um, but I guess this is the contrast of, of um, that we kind of see now in terms of people's responses to Civic Square. So this is... Um, in 1989, um, the, um, the way that the library entry looked. Um, and I was going to kind of read out this fairly in, I don't know if any of you have read this Canberra Cosmos book, but the, the author sort of says here, well, look, there's lots of other really interesting things in Canberra, but Civic is not one of them. There's no, nothing really here to look at. It's all very bleak and um, it basically this is the kind of thing that he was, I guess, responding to. But this is, uh, this to me gives a kind of hope, but also in heritage. This is a fantastic image from 1975 that reminds us that, um, that as a place that is open, that what, that which was the original concept, both in the design brief and by the architects, that Civic Square offers possibilities for the future. So. Um, there's scant information on this image. I found it in the CMAG resource archive. But, there, but the one bit that was there was that it said music to Tangerine Dream. Um, and, you know, if, if anyone remembers Tangerine Dream, I'm, and I'm sure you can, it looks like a giant lava lamp. Um, and uh, so just a, a, really, um, a really sort of fabulous thing. And um, oh, do you have any comments on any of that stuff? 
um, so far. No, I'll, I'll be, that's okay. So I, I, I wanted to quote in, in finishing um, Roy Simpson in speaking in 1997 upon the awarding of his RAIA gold medal. And after, you know, a very long uh, life in practice with many, many buildings, he actually nominates Civic Square as one of the three of his most important projects. And he notes that, I've long believed that architects in their quest for personal creativity and individual projects have rather lost control of the wider scene. The revolution in architecture brought us freedom, but it robbed us of taste. It's hard to overstate the importance of the precinct in our towns and cities, but compared with individual buildings or overall city planning, it has received minimal attention. The needs of people predicate the design of precincts as they do buildings, only the scale is different. So he's really advocating a holistic approach and I guess that's at a core to his, I guess, utopian idea of, of design, that design can be um, added to and, and, uh, and connected with, but that um, I guess it should also have a respectfulness to human behaviour. But I guess a, a kind of um, comment, though, from... I've curated a, a small exhibition in Gallery 4, which is our Gallery on the Square space, by an Indigenous spatial designer and architect, Danielle Homrek, and her mother and sister. They're from Yuan Nation. Um, and their, their response to the, to the grid form as Indigenous women is to create um, a net form that, I guess, is... Um, is a contrast to the, the laid down grid. And what she says is what is utopian for some is dystopian for others. And so she, here she is reminding us that we're, we're on Aboriginal land here and that grid laid upon is, is, is laid upon their country. Okay, well, look, thank you very much. We hope that um, this is an evolving conversation. Um, and, and as I said, um, there'll be a special feature about uh, ethos in the exhibition that will open next year um, in March, Seeing Canberra. It'll be up for eight months, so you'll get a chance to see some of these things in the flesh then. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for your work. Thank you.